Well, good day to you. Trying to figure out my camera again. Having to change a couple of things, not using one program, using the program that comes with the computer, and it's being weird. So, let's begin. Yesterday, tried to start the sermon, of course, and like I said, having issues, and as soon as I moved the camera away from the screen, it uh, turned off the camera. So I didn't record yesterday's sermon. My apologies. But I will be going through the text and everything with you this morning, so I hope you find it beneficial to you in your walk. So, if you would, and if you're studying along at home, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9-12 through 12 is what we'll be going through. If you'd like, go ahead and pause the video, and we'll go right to it. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 through 12 says this. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do more and more. And aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Obviously, this letter was not written to you or I. Insofar as it is not we who are the original recipients of it. But God's universal message is paramount and profitable for mankind throughout all time. The messages are the same, and we should receive from it the application for our lives under Christ. The church had been doing a lot right as far as they are treating how they are treating one another. Now, it's not to say that they were perfect, because Paul still addressed how there were some who misrepresented the apostle in previous chapters. But Paul praises the church here as he had previously done in the first or eight verses of this chapter where and how they loved God and obeyed his commandments. Here, at least, the first part of our text is concerning brotherly love shown amongst believers. And yes, it is specific on believers, not amongst everyone else in the world, not neighborly love. Christ did, however, speak of neighborly love in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, but specifically in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, and it says this, And one of the scribes came up and heard from them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked, Which commandment is the most important? Jesus answered, This, or the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all of your strength. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. That is to love everyone. That's what Christ was trying to tell everyone. We need to love everyone. But Paul, in our text, is specifically focusing on how we interact and how we love one another. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9-11 through 11 actually is a test of status for a true Christian. If you read that, and it says this, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Now, Everybody looks at this, well, I don't hate, I don't hate. I just maybe dislike people. Well, here's the thing. The Greek word is misom, dislike strongly, detests, or an aversion for, meaning you avoid that person. See, it's not the same definition as we see hate now in modern days. Hate nowadays means you loathe, you wish ill on them. Well, I, I agree that a lot of Christians, a lot of people don't wish ill on people, but will avoid, ignore, not have anything to do with dislike. That is what the author is trying to mean there in 1 John. <clears throat> Going on in verse 10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Chapter 3, verse 10 of the same book 
says this, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. That's harsh. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So we got to understand what we mean by love. You're fond of these people. They're family. You'll do anything for them. You'll take care of them. It's the same definition that Jesus used in his life and interactions with his disciples. Those who are followers of Christ, those who are God-fearers, it's the same feeling that he had for them. Do you think that God incarnate Christ walked around disliking people who were God fears Christ followers not even a little bit chapter 4 verse 7 through 8 says beloved let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God to, and knows God anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love brotherly love is reflected in the important practice of providing hospitality, even. So that's a part of it. You interact and you're hospitable to other people. Hospitality doesn't mean just serving meals. Hospitable means you enjoy interacting with them and you're eager to serve them, to help them, do things for them. It doesn't sound like we're avoiding anyone. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Doesn't just say specific saints. It doesn't just say one or two saints. Doesn't say the ones in our Sunday school class just who come in contact with us on Sunday mornings who approach me and say hi. It's not that. It's of the saints, plural, all. Chapter, uh, excuse me, 3 John verse 10 says, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing talking wicked nonsense against us and not content with that. He refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. That's contrary to what we are supposed to be acting. That very person right there who is avoiding people, who's talking nonsense against others, should be dealt with. So that's what we get an idea of brotherly love. This church in Thessalonica didn't need reiteration of the need to practice brotherly love. They had it on. They had it going right. Many Christians have the idea that loving doesn't mean liking. Oh, I love you, but I'd be okay if you fell on your backside on your way out. Oh, I love you. I'm just going to ignore you. Again, do you think that's what God means? Imagine if God practiced this love with us. We tend to look at families and believe since we were taught that if we couldn't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Or we have taught our families to just ignore each other. And we've been taught that. If you don't like somebody, just ignore them. We have given God great cause to just ignore us. Imagine if he did that because of our disobedience. And we're not perfect, so you can't look past our imperfections and think, well, I don't warrant that type of action from God. We technically do. And yet God still continues to love us and still show hospita hospitality towards us in giving us provisions, taking care of us daily. But that is terrible advice. One of the difficult things that Haley and I are trying to do right now is to teach our boys to work problems out by talking through it. He took my toy. He looked at me weird. He's mocking me. He said, I'm silly. Did you talk to him? No. Go talk. And they'll be done. But they, got, they have to get into the habit of talking. So, again, imagine if God treated us this way just ignored us. The world would fall apart. As he holds the world in his hand. Nothing happens outside of his will. So, again, imagine if God just ignored mankind. It would be pure doom. My prayer is that we are like this church in Thessalonica, never needing to be reminded how the images of God, us, who are in Christ, should treat each other in the family of God.
So verse 11 says this, and to aspire to live quietly and to make your, and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. So the very first, first point, if you're taking notes that I want you to get, you do your work diligently. And that's in verse 11. Paul changes the subject here. Most often authors will stay consistent with a specific thought and just hash that out in even greater detail. But as he has stated, the church needed no reminder of this. Instead, he pins the topic of perception of those who are not a part of the family of God, specifically on how we present ourselves. Yes, we tell people about Jesus, but we must make sure they see something different than they are used to seeing every day in the world or risk the persona of hypocrisy. We're hypocrites, which is becoming the world's perception of all Christians. We're hypocrites. We'll say and do things, we'll tell people to do one thing and yet turn around and act completely different. So live quietly, meaning not causing upheaval. Many Christians of old and even radical believers misunderstood this. Many chose to live a monastic life. Go and be a monk. Just stay in a compound, study your scripture, not have anything to do with any part of humanity. And that goes against what Christ had said, that we are in this world and not of it. So, uh, or even those people that want to live in a compound, compound, and just rid themselves of interaction with the world. And it is definitely not meaning that it is a vacation. We're not on vacation whenever we become a Christian. We have a job to do. That's the only reason why we're not yanked out of the baptismal waters and taken to heaven, because we have a job to do. But we'll get there. No, your rest from the world in such upheaval is to be at peace in the confidence that God's will will be enacted as we live faithfully to him. That's where your rest is. That's where your peace comes from. Your peace should be emanating from your heart because God is in control. He's taking care of it all. You don't need to worry. You don't need to stress. He is going to take care of us in one way or the other. He is hospitable to us. So likewise, we should be hospitable to one another. A contrast would be two groups of people protesting, and for lack of a better word, protesting. No, definitely not what we have seen in these last several months, but rather those groups outside of an abortion clinic. One of the groups outside the abortion clinic, clinic is yelling, Murderers! Murderers! You're evil! You're going to hell! Ah! Those kind of people. Does that sound like they're living calmly and quietly? While there's another one who is outside an abortion clinic saying, can I give you a free ultrasound? And can I just visit with you about the choice you make? See, actually, next Sunday on the 17th is actually uh, going to be uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. So, do you see which, which group is living peacefully? Which group is... Uh, living quietly. And it doesn't just mean that we just sit in our area and be calm and quiet. No, it's living life. It's active. Anything that you are doing with your life and in through your life and in, you're quiet about it. You're a peaceful person. You're not making a scene. You're not causing a problem. The protests we saw this past weekend, and yes, there were Republicans there. Yes, there were Democrats there. Yes, they've already confirmed that Antifa folk were there, and as well as other groups there that were inciting violence. Does not mean that anyone is free of action because they were a part of the protests. A great many people left. But the thing is, and you can disagree with me if you want, Christians have no business being a part of those kind of protests. I know you may disagree with me. But Christians... Again, have no business there. If this interpretation is true of living quietly, again, it's active. Anything that you do with your life, you're meant to be quiet about it. You're meant to be a peaceful part of society, not causing a scene. Well, I have the right. Well, 
You may have the right, but it doesn't make it right. It, is the believer aspiring to live quietly by participating in events that are causing large scenes being loud, drawing attention? The whole point of being quiet is that you're not drawing attention. If I'm quiet, you'd look over me. And it's not to say that we look over Christians, but we'll discuss coming in the next part what that means. But we're not supposed to cause a scene and cause all the attention to be on me. Well, Paul publicly protested in, on the treatment of Christians. Ah, well, no, he didn't. He was given a platform the times he was brought before authorities to proclaim the gospel to defend believers in their righteous acts. Have you been given the mic? Have you been called as a witness to address injustice toward believers? If you ever are, you had better be prepared to do a good job. That's completely different than what Paul is trying to address here. As you go about your daily lives, not specific circumstances where you're meant to be giving testimony on something. If any of us are called to Congress to testify on Scripture, on how we're presenting ourselves as Christian, you better be prepared and do it well. And while you have that platform, you tell people about Jesus going on. This leads on to the next point of minding our own affairs. You mean I got to mind my own business? Yes. If it doesn't directly involve you, don't do it. That's what I'm saying about protesting. It does not directly involve you. You are not called to that to represent, to speak, or do anything like that. If you're called to speak on something, again, Tell people about Jesus. Application is here. Keep your nose out of it if it does not belong to you or directly involve you. And don't give me the nonsense of, well, it's my country. Come on. And thirdly, we have work to do. You shouldn't be looking for other things to do if you have a job. So don't be jobless in a church. And churches are filled with jobless people. Whenever I say don't feel for uh, look for a job, I'm not talking secular jobs. I'm talking about responsibilities here in the church. Find something to do. There's plenty to do. Come and talk to me. We have things to do. Whenever I go out and do visits, you're, I would love for some company. Come on. But too many people in America, especially Americans, or too many people in the world, especially Americans, look at the church work like they do a secular job. Find the job that will make you happy, that you'll love. God called us to his own. We first love him. Then we are given a job that honors him, not honors us, not as self-serving. So if we love him, we will definitely love what we are doing because it is for our first love. Do you understand? Love God. You're going to love your job and your responsibility in the church. It doesn't mean that you're, yes, if you have specific talents, go for that. But if it's filled up and there's people already working in that, be support capacity, but go and find something else. Just go up to Brother Jeff, go up to I and say, Brother JR, I need a job. What do you want me to do? God's will. That's it. Whatever you want to do. I did not want to preach whenever I became a Christian. I did not want to do that. Or really, I didn't want to do student ministry. Didn't want to have anything to do with kids and teenagers. No offense if there's kids or teenagers watching out there. Just didn't want to mess with teenagers. Didn't want to do with it. I would have much rather been fine going and preaching. Well, God put me in student ministry and I fell in love with it. You notice I fell in love with it. I began to appreciate that task that God had for me and I loved it. And then eventually, over time, God had matured me and got me to this position. I wouldn't have made a good preacher early on. I was a bit of a goose. So, but if you understand this, if you can't love your job, God has you to do, you obviously have a first love problem. Love God, do your job, and you'll love your job. Notice the jobs that these people in verse 11 uh they weren't natural to them. It wasn't something that they just picked up and be like, it's instinctive. I can just do this. They had to be instructed. And you see that at the end of verse 11. It says, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. 
and to work with your hands as we instructed you. Do your job. Work with your hands. Do things as you were instructed. They had to be taught to do these things. Just like here at this church. Don't look for something that's instinctively to your abilities. Unless there is something there, then go for that. But look to just please God and honor Him and serve Him. That means walking out and saying, okay, God, whatever you want. Early on, we tend to say that, but whenever it comes time to do whatever God wants, well, I can't do that. You can't, maybe because you haven't been instructed yet. But that just means that you need to be instructed. So, moving on, verse 12 says this, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Verse 12, your point is, you live your life purposefully. The world doesn't need to see another worldly person. They need to see someone different. Someone intentionally living contrary to the ways of this world. Someone who is dependent on the ident someone who is dependent on somebody else, like politicians, grand speakers, athletes, YouTube personalities. Blah. Don't be like me. I know I'm on YouTube right now, but don't don't be like me. Be like Jesus. Social media famed people, they need someone in the world needs to see a unique person change for the better because of the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. It means acknowledging one's sinfulness, realizing that you can't make it, you cannot please God on your own. You have to have Christ to stand before the Father and say, He's mine. And that only happens by acknowledging your sinfulness. Believing who Christ was throughout his entire life, a perfect human being who lived his life, died on a cross, so that you did not have to face death eternally, separated from God, and redeemed you, and saved you, and you confess him as king. You say, he is my king. Jesus is my Lord. And you'll be able to say, whatever you want, God, I'll do and mean it. Think about this. If you go to a church and you say whatever you want, and then whenever you're given something, you say, I don't want that. Are you living up to your salvific calling? By saying, no, God, I don't want that. Don't walk as outsiders before the world who just pick and choose. I want this. I want that. I just want to do this just so it makes me happy. My feelings are important. That's for another day. But the purpose is clear. And this is it. And I'll pray for you. All this is a firm reminder that the gospel is only as believable as the changed lives of those who proclaim it. Do you understand? The gospel is only as believable as the changed lives of those who proclaim it. You should be different than everyone else in the world. You were saved to be a unique person, not like anyone else in this world. Definitely not like a worldly person, a person who is outside of Christ. We don't need little bitty... Uh, politicians running around. We monopolize our time talking about Jesus more than we do politics. Can I pray for you? God, thank you for my church family. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this medium, on this venue of YouTube and on the internet. God, I pray for that one person that just stumbles across this who maybe is struggling with their walk but just needs that reminder. God, you do something great in their minds. You do something with this message, this video, because it's all for your will, yours alone, not mine. Father, bless my church family. Bless all those who watch this. Keep them safe. Keep them well during all these things that are going on. God, thank you for a new year. Thank you for new beginnings. God, we love you. 
We ask that you bless this and all these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you and I love you. May he be with you as you go.